to our careers in chemical engineering presentation today. Um, we hopefully have an exciting event for you. I'm just going to get the PowerPoint going here. Um, Dr. Maria Coleman is going to start things off with a, a welcome, and then um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the curriculum very briefly. Um, then we'll get things started with our alumni panel, and you'll get to hear from some of our um, graduates about where their career has taken them. And then um, uh, we're joined by some of our current students to talk about their, um, their co-op opportunities that they've had the privilege to um, be part of, and then admissions is going to talk for a little bit, and then we have a Q&A at the very end um, to just kind of open things up with any questions that we may have not gotten answered. So I'm going to go ahead and get things started and um, turn things over to Dr. Coleman. First, let me thank all of you for uh, joining us this evening and uh, our, our panelists uh, for taking time out at uh, what at least in Toledo is dinner time. Um, to uh, spend a little time with us and talk about what they do. I'm always really excited to hear about the uh, jobs and opportunities that our, our students have after they leave us and, and where they go. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about this evening. I get this question a lot. What do chemical engineers do? And um, I, I won't say how long I've been a chemical engineer, but it's been long enough that the chemical engineering field has changed quite a bit in the X number of years I've been uh, a chemi. And you know, when I started, it was a lot of working in uh, fuels and working in, in, in chemical products. And now as a chemical engineer, we have students who are working in energy, both uh, sort of pet petroleum-based energy and alternative energy. We have students who work in the materials area, a lot of students working with plastics and, and polymers, for example. A lot of our students end up in the food industry, working with bio-based products and specialty uh, chemicals for personal care products and the environment. And so with a degree in chemical engineering, the opportunities are, are boundless. And you'll see that with uh, our panelists today. And we don't have it, have it on here as well, but uh, we have students who uh, choose to go on to medical school or choose to go on to law school after they finish. All of these are opportunities that they have. You can switch agenda. So, um, you know, what, what, what do students study in, if they're studying chemical engineering? Chemical engineering really takes the principles of chemistry, physics, mathematics, and biology and applies it to solving real world problems. What makes chemical engineers chemical engineers, I think, really is that we do take a little bit more chemistry than other disciplines do. Um, and we have some biology sort of embedded in some of the work that we do. So we take this, this, this uh, pillar, this base of material of courses and, and, and uh, then apply it to uh, real world problems by taking certain uh, specific classes. And we've got some of those listed there. Um, some of the highlights I'm sure our panelists will remember are react, you know, sort of reactor design. How do I go from a small scale reaction that we might do in the lab to something much larger that can make enough product to, to serve the need that we have? Um, so if we can go on to the next slide, Jenna. Our discipline is really laid out, and this is sort of laying, laying out the courses that we take. About 30% of the classes that you take are in chemical engineering. You'll be taking those with the faculty in our department uh, with your cohorts. Uh, another, oh, I'd say about, it looks like about 20% is chemistry classes, then mathematics, and then you have some electives in, in the humanities areas. We uh, do have some engineering electives, both within our department and within the college, uh, physics, and then your free electives. And that's really how your, your time is um, spent in the classroom here at the University of Toledo. Um, and I think with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chanda. She's going to talk a little bit about our co-op program. Yep. Thank you, Dr. Coleman. I think I froze. There we go. All right. So, um, and I got I believe I forgot to say my name. So my name is Chianda Rain and I am the Director of Student Services for the Chemical Engineering Department. So what does that mean? It also means that I am the undergraduate advisor for the program too as well. So um, I'm happy that you are all able to join us today. So just to talk to you a little bit about our uh, mandatory co-op program, um, obviously it's a value added to our curriculum. So there are three required rotations um, that are um, 
worked into the curriculum. So you basically alternate between coursework and um, co-oping. So when you go on co-op, it's a semester long um, work experience and these are paid positions. So the entire semester you will be working 40 hours a week um, for that particular semester. And um, in our co-op plans, you'll, you'll co-op during a fall semester, a spring semester, and a summer semester to get your three um, required co-ops in. You do have the opportunity to um, co-op for a fourth and even possibly a fifth rotation if you can work that in. Um, but you do get that hands-on experience. So you get to apply what you've been learning into the classroom into a real world um, work experience. So, which is a lot, a lot of, one of the reasons a lot of our students have um, chosen our program too. These are relevant projects and assignments. So um, they will be um, geared towards where your learning experience is. They're not going to, these companies aren't going to expect you to um, be performing as a full-time engineer on your first co-op work experience. So you have a lot of help along the way and guidance. And you are supervised by engineers who a lot of times are actually alums of our program, which is a pretty cool thing. Um, and as you co-op, if you stay with the same company, your responsibility uh, levels are increased on each co-op rotation. And it is a one credit hour course, and there is a $475 co-op fee that is required for all three co-op rotations. That's the only thing that you pay that semester as far as tuition goes. Um, and if you do co-op on a fourth or fifth co-op rotation, that um, co-op fee is waived, and you still do maintain your full-time student status when you are on a co-op rotation. So the benefits of co-ops are obviously you're transferring your skills of what you're learning into the classroom to practical work experience. You get to discover different types of jobs in the industry. And as you'll hear from our alums today, there are um, vast opportunities within the industry. Um, developing strong work habits, habits and ethics. I mean, that, that's always a, an added bonus, you know, regardless of what type of position that you're in. Um, we always encourage students to kind of test out, you know, new geographical areas, get out of that comfort zone. Don't necessarily stay um, locally looking right around Toledo. You know, we have co students who co-op all across the country. So um, definitely get out of that comfort zone. It gives you the opportunity to kind of um, explore new areas as well for a semester. You're going to gain work-related experience, you know, what puts you at an advantage above some of your other peers at other schools that don't have a mandatory co-op program. You do get to earn some money that helps offset, you know, your tuition expenses. So average co-op wage was $22.19 an hour um, for a full-time salary that equates to right around $74,000 a year on average. Um, and then also you have more job advancements versus graduates not having participated in, the, in a program. Um, and you can actually, a lot of our students graduate um, having already um, secured a full-time co-op our full-time um, position um, from their co-op company upon graduation. So that takes the stress away from that last semester when you're trying to finish up your classwork of that job search when you already know that you have your full-time job um, already secured. And you learn to navigate the workplace, which is definitely an added bonus too as well. As I mentioned previously, um, about 48% of our students, and this was for fall 2019 and 2020, um, graduating from the University of Toledo with uh, chemical engineering degrees, finished without college loans. And that is primarily due to the fact that the, the co-op, the mandatory co-op program, nationally that average is right around 17% graduate without college loans. So we have a definite advantage having the co-op uh, program be a mandatory part of our curriculum then. So I know you all came to hear from our um, alumni and our students, so I am not going to um, take up too much more of your time, but if you do have questions for myself or Dr. Coleman, we are definitely gonna be available at the end. So I just wanna take a quick minute to, and I'm gonna let all the, our panelists um, uh, actually introduce themselves, but I do want just to um, show you our, our, our slide here um, of where their current positions are. So um, I'm gonna ask all of them to, as they speak, to introduce themselves, um, talk a little bit about when they graduated, what year they graduated, um, and you know, if they have been working for their current employer since graduation, talk about you know, maybe their different roles within the company, um, if they've had different employers since graduation, if you could elaborate on where you were, and then also talk a little bit about your current position and like what it's like in a, on a day-to-day -day basis in your current position. So I know um, we're gonna uh, go alphabetically, but um, we're gonna start with Blake actually, because he does need to exit. Um, so Blake, if you wanna go ahead and get things started, I'm gonna um, turn it over to you then. And I'll stop sharing my screen so we can all see you.
Hello, guys. Uh, my name's uh, Blake Biederstead. Um, I, I guess I'll start talking about my uh, co-op experience uh, while at the University of Toledo. Um, my first co-op was with Owens Corning, and that was out in Kansas City. So I, I know Chanda, she just mentioned recently, um, it, it's nice to check out different geographic locations. Um, it definitely uh, takes you out of your comfort zone, which um, as an engineer, there's oftentimes you're gonna be um, pressured to be out of your comfort zone. So uh, that was a great experience. So um, out there, I was working uh, as a process engineer, um, talking to uh, line associates, uh, trying to find efficient ways to uh, manufacture insulation, both bat and loose fill insulation. Um, my second co-op was with Honda, um, and I actually have a full-time job with Honda now, but that was with uh, Honda's uh, supplier quality and development group. So while at that, um, while at that position, I went to uh, different suppliers that Honda had, and we would teach them uh, what's called a uh, Lean Six Sigma training. Um, it's basically trying to make suppliers more efficient. We would uh, give them tips and tricks on how to um, be more efficient and um, also help them show them, hey, if you clean up this area, you're gonna be saving money. Um, in turn, if you, know, you save money, Honda saves money, it's a big win-win. So that was a, a very eye-opening experience for me. Um, after that, I did a systems um, engineering uh, internship with ABB. Um, I worked on human machine interfaces, um, actually in one of the largest uh, power plants in Iowa. Um, so that was uh, good to get uh, a little insight on that industry. Um, and then I also did an internship uh, with Pilkington Glass. And I know uh, Dan is on the call. He also did an internship with Pilkington as well. Uh, but I worked in the um, lab environment there, um, did um, some testing of some prototype glass, some thin film technology, which was um, extremely beneficial, uh, which actually uh, brings me to my role now. So um, after college, um, I got a full-time offer with uh, Honda, um, working in their new model development group. So as a uh, new model quality uh, supplier engineer, um, I am in charge of about 15 different suppliers now, and one of them being Glass, and uh, actually Pilkington is one of my suppliers I'm in charge of, but um, I have a lot of uh, polypropylene suppliers as well, so polymer suppliers. Uh, they make a lot of interior and exterior trim parts. Um, but with that being said, just, just a quick little summary of, of my job without getting too into the weeds here. So um, somebody described this, when I first started Honda, they described Honda and the automotive industry uh, basically like the government. So you have your design group. Uh, so they are like the um, legislative branch. So they will make the drawings for, um, let's say a, a new model CRV. So they'll make, make the drawings, they will say, these are the dimensions we want uh, the front windshield to be. We want it to look like this, um, and this is how we want it to fit in the car. This is how we want it to look appearance-wise. And then so they will take that drawing, and then they'll send that to the plant. And the plant is like the judicial branch. They will go in, they'll interpret the drawings. They'll say, oh, the dimensions don't look good here. Um, oh, you're missing a, a spec here that we want the supplier to meet. You need to go back and change this and revise this. And then that brings the job to me. So then uh, my, my branch of government is the executive branch. So I will go and execute what the plan and what design, um, you know, want. So if, for example, the front windshield, if the front windshield isn't what's supposed to look like dimensionally, I'll have to go to the supplier and uh, basically help them, you know, mature their part. So essentially in the process design, they make a drawing, they will um, send that out to our purchasing department, a different purchasing department than mine. Um, that drawing will go to five different suppliers, they'll quote it out. Whoever comes back, um, they'll base the bid off of, you know, who comes in at a cheaper price, but also who has the least amount of quality concerns. Uh, there's no point in picking a, a really, cheap you know supplier cheap part 
if you're going to have quality concerns throughout the life cycle of the model and you know you get a crv later on that you know it doesn't look really good so at that point when the supplier gets business if it's my supplier then i will work with them to create tooling i'll work that with them to create fixtures so my job is pseudo chemical engineering and pseudo almost mechanical engineering so then after they uh create a part um i'll switch back to like a polypropylene part so like a exterior garnish next to your door um the supplier will make that part and um if they say hey blake you know we have a lot of flash coming off of this exterior garnish so that means you know there's some extra you know polypropylene like extra plastic coming off the sides that you know doesn't look appeasing you know appealing to the eyes and also if it's really sharp you know it can actually scratch you and hurt you then i'll go to the supplier and then you know we'll try to uh, come up with different processing methods to get rid of that flash. So maybe they put in too much material into their um, injection mold. Maybe that's the solution. But then uh, we have different um, new model milestones uh, throughout the new model life cycle. So our first milestone, we call it Dan Zero. So that's first shots off a tool. The supplier will make five parts and they'll send one of those parts to Honda and we will have a meeting with a supplier, myself, assembly design, we'll all be in that meeting. And then we'll put the part on the car. So if it's the front windshield, we'll see if it fits. If it fits, you know, great. Two thumbs up. Everybody, you know, gets a little pat on the back. But if it doesn't fit, now we need to figure out, you know, who, who's at fault here or who needs to lead this investigation? If it doesn't fit, maybe it's my fault. Maybe um, the supplier didn't make it correctly. I'll go put the part on the fixture. We'll, we'll look into that. Um, also, there's a chance that maybe Honda designed the part bad. So if that's the case, my part looks good on the fixture, um, then maybe, you know, the design's bad. And then there's a third option. Well, maybe the design of my part is good. Maybe the part itself is good, but maybe somebody else's component isn't made correctly. Maybe the body of the car is, you know, 10 millimeters too wide and the glass doesn't fit. That's also a possibility. Um, but then um, we have several different events up until mass production. Um, we don't, uh, this uh, process takes years, takes three to five years to come up with a new model. It's not instantaneous, unfortunately. Um, it takes a lot of uh, time um, and a lot of effort among many departments to uh, create a, such, a successful launch to a vehicle. Uh, but um, I know when I started at Honda, I did a, uh, engineering uh, development program, I would highly recommend it um, if given the chance and a full-time opportunity. So during that, I bounced around to several different departments that I interact with daily. I went to mass production purchasing, went to a, a quality improvement center, um, also went to our uh, mass production purchasing department and then our plant uh, engineering design group. And uh, that gave me a lot of um, a, a good network in Honda to bounce ideas off of if I had problems with a supplier or if um, somebody came to me, you know, after I worked in that uh, department, I could be their contact. Uh, but also besides creating that network, you gain an immense amount of knowledge uh, from these different departments. Now you understand how they work, what their responsibilities are. So uh, if anybody had an opportunity to do that full time, um, I would say go for it. Um, I know here too, um, I, I did a panel uh, a couple months ago, um, but um, Toledo, I had a great experience at Toledo, uh, both co-oping and full-time. It, it's hard to bring in all the Toledo graduates into these. I know I've had uh, chemical engineering friends at Toledo work for NASA. I have one friend over um, that uh, Zach Holtzapel and I graduated with. Uh, he works in Sweden as a process engineer for um, a water manufacturing plant. So um, I would say the sky's the limit with Toledo. Thank you, Blake. Thank you so much. And no problem. And, and sorry, guys, I have to jump off, but um, I wish you guys luck. Thanks, Blake. Yep. Thank you, Chanda. Vamantha, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, 
Can you guys hear me? Yep, we can hear you fine. Okay. Um, so I'm Vimantha. Uh, I graduated last year, December. Uh, and so I did my co-ops in, um, in the pharmaceutical industry. So I worked at AstraZeneca uh, for my first, second, third, and fourth rotations. So my first rotation was in, uh, in a microbiology lab uh, in uh, quality control. Uh, uh, I was in Indiana, it was uh, Evansville, Indiana. So about six, seven hours from uh, Toledo. And then um, my second rotation was in the general chemistry lab, also in QC. So in QC, they do all the uh, release testing. So as you know, pharmaceuticals, um, they're one of the highly regulated industries. So you have a lot of uh, testing you need to do on your product before releasing to make sure there's no contamination. It's up to its uh, specifications and all of that. And then my third rotation was in uh, validation engineering. Um, so I did a lot of uh, equipment validation, process validation, uh, and also supported formulation engineering. So formulation engineering, you kind of uh, put all the ingredients and make the final product. Um, and uh, I also did uh, one or two research co-ops with, uh, with the chemi department uh, uh, with my advisor, Dr. Alba Rubio. And then after graduation, uh, I joined Moderna as an engineer. Uh, so I currently work as an engineer at Moderna in uh, Boston. So Moderna is a, a biotech company, if you're familiar with the COVID vaccine. So they produce the COVID vaccine. Uh, so to talk about uh, kind of like an introduction to uh, what I do, uh, so we make mRNA vaccines at Moderna. So to kind of give an introduction about mRNA, so every cell in your body uses mRNA to kind of produce uh, kind of provide real-time instructions to make proteins that you need to survive and to that you need to fight against any diseases. So at Moderna, we're building a new class of medicine uh, based on this mRNA uh, technology. Uh, so simply put, uh, if you receive the COVID vaccine, uh, what you so you got injected uh, an mRNA construct. Uh, that would give specific instructions to your cells in your body to make the spike protein. Uh, uh, so it's kind of like a recipe for your cells to, pr to produce the spike protein. Uh, and then your immune system in your body uh, recognize the foreign, foreign protein and generates an immune response against it. So it makes antibodies to fight against it and destroys it. So the whole process of making this antibody for the spike protein get uh, stored as a memory in your B cells. Uh, so if you actually get the COVID virus uh, down the line, your body already knows how to make the antibodies against it because it's stored in its memory cells. Um, so that's kind of what we do. So my role, I support analytical development and uh, process development teams in research and development at Moderna. Um, so what we do is basically uh, when you make your drug product, uh, you have to do a lot of testing on it. You know, you have to do a lot of characterization techniques on it to release the material as a commercial product, right? Um, so for example, if you're looking at purity of your product, you could do um, HPLC, mass spec. If you're looking at the structure of mRNA, you could look at uh, native sec, you know, a cryo EM. Um, there's a lot of characterization techniques you could do to kind of Look at different things. Uh, so what we do in analytical development, we design all these test methods. We develop uh, based on whatever we need. We develop all these testing methods to test our drug substance or our drug product to see if it's up to its uh, specifications. Um, and you can also do. We also support with any 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 um, development studies we might have. So for example. Uh, all the raw materials we use, um, if you want to, so the raw materials would be enzymes for us. Um, if you want to get an idea of the activity of the enzymes, it would, we would do uh, kinetics on our enzymes and get an idea of how they perform, uh, you know, uh, kind of optimize reaction parameters, reaction time, concentrations, you know, what you add, so all of that. So we do 
uh, we support process development teams to kind of increase the yield, uh, you know, reduce reaction times and all of that. And also with method development to um, kind of uh, develop the methods to test our final drug product. So yeah, um, so that's kind of uh, what I do. That's awesome. Thank you so much. We'll have questions for you later. Uh, Zach, do you want to go next, please? Can you guys hear me? Yep, we can. So my name is Zach Holtapple. I actually graduated with Blake back in 2017, the fall of 2017. Um, just to kind of get some information out there, I'm a medical student at the University of Toledo College of Medicine. I'm a fourth year medical student, so I've already completed my first three years and then my last year and currently applying for residency, which is typically uh, the direction that we go um, after completing medical school. So in eight months, I'll be a doctor, but it will take extra training to actually be able to see patients um, by myself. Um, so let's see, during uh, chemical engineering, I did four internships at the refinery. Um, and I would, anyone who's thinking about any type of graduate school, I would highly recommend doing some type of engineering um, because it really diversifies you um, when you look at other applicants, a lot of people, at least in medical school, will do biology degrees um, or some type of um, degree associated with biology or like neuroscience. But a lot of my colleagues actually are engineers within medical school. And I think in my class, the class of 2022, most people that were accepted were engineering majors and not biology majors. Um, so I think that helped out a lot, uh, especially during interviews as well. Uh, I'm sure that's probably like the most unique perspective that I can give um, because I've gone through medical school and stuff, but kind of just to jump back for a second, I did four internships at the refinery, like I said before, uh, to lead a refining company. That set me up well. That was a lot of different experiences uh, rolled within that. Um, I was a process engineer, so the first internship, you were kind of introduced to what refining is um, and the macroscopic scale of what refining is. Um, the second internship I did project management, so I was able to uh, lead some of, some of the different projects uh, like, um, let's see, wastewater control treatment um, and some different types of solvent systems that they have at the refinery and help optimize those. The third internship I had to the refining company was more of energy optimization, so working with a lot of different heaters, um, looking at how to optimize um, energy savings costs and stuff like that. And then the fourth internship at um, that company allowed us to actually work as a independent engineer. Um, obviously we had some uh, oversight, you know, um, on what we can and can't do, but that was a very meaningful experience for me, especially when I would go into interviews. And I actually plan on saying a lot of that stuff during my uh, residency application interviews as well. The autonomy that you get uh, in these co-ops is second to none, um, especially when you're dealing with, you know, from my perspective, a lot of other, uh, my colleagues haven't actually had real world jobs, haven't had to have the autonomy and have the high pressure situations of actually making um, changes that would affect, um, you know, how much money a company may make or the, you know, the safety of other um, employees. Um, so that translates well into, you know, the medical field um, I'm trying to think of what else. I've wrote uh, different publications and different magazines or journals, I should say, about some of the parallels that chemical engineering shares with um, medical school. I can, I, I can share that with Shanda as well. But, you know, from a uh, pathophysiology standpoint, when we look at the body, um, a lot of this stuff translates well into, you know, why we use certain medications and why, um, you know, ventilation or intubation or why we, well, how the uh, heart works as well. Um, and I always thought that was really interesting. I think engineering teaches you always to ask questions why, and, you know, it helps you understand. And I think a lot of my colleagues didn't help out with, you know, they didn't have that background. So some of the things that I had called out in some of my articles talked about, like, how blood vessels will change their diameter um, and that will help change blood flow. So like if you get stabbed, um, a lot of your arteries will constrict uh, and the reason for that is to increase um, the blood pressure. So that way your organs to, can still perfuse. 
But the way that chemical engineering translates into that is we think about the cross-sectional area, we think about how it decreases, how our arteries constrict, and how that back pressure will allow better organ um, perfusion, you know, if you get stabbed so that we can conserve your, uh, your blood volume. And that's just, you know, one example. I mean, kidneys, there's huge in um, <laughs> chemical engineering. It, it made its uh, nephrology super easy. Um, and, and, and a lot of different topics really easy. So I can talk a little bit about medical school too. The first two years, it's all preclinical. It's a lot of uh, work within the classroom, studying a lot. Um, and it's not easy by any means. Uh, the third year, you actually get to go into clinic. You get to actually see patients. You get to experience what it's going to be like to be a doctor. And you also get to experience, you know, the good parts and the bad parts and, um, you know, dealing with real world people and not just books. Fourth year, which is what I'm in right now, um, you get to basically pick what you want to do. So right now I'm on ophthalmology. So I'm learning about, you know, the eye. Um, last, the last two weeks I had before this, I was on radiation oncology. So that's working with physics and um, designing certain radiation beams to help uh, deal with cancers, you know, in conjunction with chemotherapy. Uh, other things that I've done this year, it's like hospice and palliative care, which has been pretty eye-opening to be able to talk to patients um, about, you know, end of life goals. Um, cardiology, which is probably what I want to do. Uh, I've done uh, a month of that and then also ICU as well. So medical school is very fulfilling, but as you can see, you know, it's a long path. I, like I said, I graduated with Blake uh, and he's, you know, well off and probably has a pretty good lifestyle right now. It's, you know, working probably about 50 hours, 60 hours, not getting paid like co-ops, which I wish it was like co-ops because that was nice. And then, like I said, I'll have three to six more years of training, which I'll be making about, you know, one tenth of what I should be making um, when I'm a doctor. And I'll be working 80 to um, 80 hours is the maximum amount, but sometimes they have you work more. So, but yeah, that's that's where I'm at right now. I've, I would say Toledo definitely set me up well to succeed both in medical school and just in life in general. It allows for a lot of different opportunities, not only with co-ops to help make money, but scholarships too. And I think that the University of Toledo really helped me, um, you know, be able to make a difference in my own life and other people's lives. And this is completely voluntary. You know, I traveled back from clinic and I haven't ate yet today. So like, I'm not doing this just because like somebody's telling me to do this. Like I actually want to come in on here and tell you guys how awesome it was to go to Toledo. So if you guys have any questions or anything, you can always uh, shoot out an email to me and I'll try to send that article out to Shanda and Dr. Coleman too. Thank you, Zach. Thank you so much. So if you have a chance to stay online with us, I think we'll probably have some questions at the end for you too. Dan, you're up next, please. All right, I'll try to keep it short. I know we're running low on time and we've got a lot of good people to talk to. So hello everyone, my name is Dan Rickenbaugh. I graduated chemical engineering in December of 2020. I was in the same class as Vimanta, though I took a completely different path than Vimanta. I am now a maintenance and engineering FMDP at Nestle, located here in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, FMDP stands for Factory Management Development Program. So you guys heard Blake mention uh, doing an engineering rotational program after full time. Well, this is a, one of many rotation programs that are located in companies across the United States. What I'm in is I'm in a two-year program in an engineering, focused on the engineering and maintenance function to help me grow as more of a people leader in the engineering and maintenance function, as well as developing different technical skills related to what maintenance is, what engineering is at Nestle, and then growing my skills from there. Uh, for the last seven months, I've been in sort of a, a project engineering role where I've been just tackling what were supposed to be small projects, but have quickly turned into much larger projects, uh, just as the nature of the beast. Uh, prior to that, I did complete four co-ops with two separate companies. Uh, the first three co-ops were, were, were with a company called the Andersons. Uh, they are located out of Maumee. Their main headquarters is based out of Maumee, Ohio. I was in their, my first co-op took place at their Indiana plant, about 45 minutes away from Purdue University, where I lived for the summer. Had a fantastic time. I was just coming out of spring semester with uh, heat transfer with Dr. Coleman. Had a blast. And turns out a lot of my projects were dealing with heat transfer and fluids 
a lot of the material that you learn as a sophomore chemical engineer. So I'm jumping right in, I'm diving in, having a great time that summer. Second rotation took me to Greenville, Ohio, down near Dayton. And I that was more of a maintenance focused co-op. I reported to the maintenance manager and I got to take part in my first ever shutdown. Was in charge of about six contractors and we were doing a project of changing out the oil of uh, the 100 pumps and different other fans that were throughout the plant. You think, oh, changing the oil is, that's not that hard. When you only have four days to do it, it's a lot. It's, you gotta act quite fast. Uh, lots of learning there, lots of self-learning there. Uh, I think that's very much not recognized when we talk about this co-op program is just how much personal development you have during these events. And third co-op was completely different, took me out of the factory and took me into the corporate headquarters in Maumee. I was, I guess you, I called myself a corporate engineer. And basically what I did is I played around with a program called OSI Soft Pi. And I was building this huge architecture for helping the plants see the data, see all their flows, their steam usage, their water, their ethanol production, everything that I could. And I was putting this architecture together for all four of our plants. Uh, quite the task. It was over $250,000 project. And here I am, uh, an intern that's been with the company for a little over a year at that point. And it was just uh, to have that kind of ownership was just amazing. I knew I wanted to be in food. So for my fourth co-op, I had the opportunity to leave the Andersons and actually go to a company called Ingredion. They are, I was based in the Indianapolis, Indiana location. So I lived in downtown Indy. I was an environmental health and safety co-op. So a bit different role than what I was used to. And there's a whole backstory. If somebody wants to hear the whole backstory behind that, it wasn't actually supposed to be environmental health and safety, but still enjoyed it. Nonetheless, learned a lot more about process safety, which I didn't really have a strong uh, background in. So definitely it's a huge advantage, plus being in the food industry in general. Uh, food industry can be very selective, especially trying to get into other industries such as food and pharmaceuticals. So then finally, uh, application season coming around and Nestle had this application out and here I am, uh, seven, going on eight months now. I uh, can't believe it's almost a year since graduation. Went by really, really fast and I'm sure it's just gonna go by faster and faster, but uh, hope I didn't make anybody hungry. Uh, and so um, working at the Stouffer's plan, I feel like every day I go out on the floor, I get myself hungry. Um, but it's still just being a part of Nestle. When you hear people, when you tell people you work for Nestle, or if any of us, we tell them we work for these companies, you're like, really? I'm like, yes, me as a chemical engineer from Little Toledo came to work for one of the biggest food and beverage companies in the world. So that's a little bit about me and what I do in my day, day to day. Uh, I'll stick, I'll be sticking around for questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dan. Yep. Uh, Lisa. Hi, guys. All right. So my name is Lisa Young, and I will preface this with I am still at work, um, so I apologize. Note the uniform. Also, my radio is going to be going off probably the whole time, so I'm, I'm sorry for that. Um, but I guess I graduated University of Toledo in the fall of 2019. Um, before graduation, I did three co-op rotations with Husky Energy off of their Lima refinery, um, which I guess are now called Synovus Energy. Um, so my first two rotations were in their environmental department. The first one I was focused on wastewater and waste management. Uh, so as a co-op, I was responsible for all of our waste management tracking. Um, so knowing how long uh, generated waste has been on site where it's going, how it's getting there, um, and also just making sure it gets there in a timely manner so we stay in the compliance, as well as all of our wastewater treatment, making sure we stay within compliance for our discharge. My second rotation, um, I was able to gain more responsibility and I worked on the air compliance side of things, uh, which was actually at a really good time as refineries had just been put under a large um, uh, environmental excursion um, type of reporting. Uh, for shutdowns and turnarounds. So I actually got to work with a big team of operations and engineers um, to be able to prep for the turnaround and bring in external contracts to make sure that we were staying compliant even events of shutdowns of startups. And then I determined at that point, environmental really wasn't where I wanted to stay. Um, so they were really great and worked with me to get into a process engineering type role. So I did my third rotation with their process engineering department, which um, was definitely one of the best experiences that I think I'd ever had. 
Um, I got to work uh, as a, I guess I had a process engineering mentor um, that I worked with, um, and he was able to show me all the different things. I got to supervise a catalyst loading and get inside of a different type of reactor. Um, I also got to do my own daily tasks as well as some larger projects. So my daily tasks would be things like unit health monitoring, so pressure surveys, temperature surveys, catalyst tracking, um, pulling data into Excel, um, interpolating it with the things that I'd learned in school, um, and then being able to report back out on that. And then also uh, the larger projects, such as determining a pump is not sized correctly for its unit, determining the upsizing requirements that need to be done um, in order to change out that pump, but also understanding the broader scope of all of the work that I completed for upsizing the pump wouldn't be economical with the upcoming changes in the plant. Um, so it's things like that that I learned throughout my cooperation uh, that really helped prepare me for looking for my full-time job. So I guess full-time, I work as a process engineer for Cleveland Cliffs. Um, so Cleveland Cliffs started as a iron ore mining company. So we mine and make little pellets. I don't know if you guys can see this. Um, so up in our mines in Minnesota. And then uh, they are all barged down. Uh, for, so specifically as it regards to my plant. So these pellets go a lot of different places um, and most of them end up in steel products. Um, but specifically as it care, I care about personally at my plant, um, they're barged down Minnesota, down the Maumee River to our Toledo hot briquetted iron plant where we make these things. So these are hot briquetted iron or HBI. Um, so it's essentially a substitute for high grade scrap metal as it goes into different types of steel furnaces. So um, I guess there's three main types of steel furnaces, BOFs, blast furnaces, and EAFs, um, which all just use a different form of energy to reduce iron um, so that it's metallic and then add other components to make good steel. So I guess when I hired on with Cliffs, they were primarily a mining company and had this crazy idea to build an HBI plant in Toledo. Um, and now they've progressed to be the uh, United States largest flat rolled steel company as they purchased out ArcelorMittal and AK Steel. Um, so it's been really cool to watch Cliffs grow in that perspective. Um, but it's also really cool because I hired onto my plant when we were still in construction phase. So when I hired onto my plant, uh, they hadn't been on site for more than a few months. Um, and everything was still brand new. Everything was still under construction. There were still over 1,100 contractors on site. Everything was crazy. So they finished construction. Um, <coughs> I'm sorry. So we got near the end of construction and then COVID hit. So we went through three months of learning how to navigate COVID while still um, being in construction, as well as trying to turn the corner into commissioning and operation. Uh, so that was definitely really interesting. So I got to work through all the construction the finishing end of construction, all the commissioning, and then I've been with them into their initial operation. So I guess my specific role as a process engineer is um, a little bit different uh, than most places will have you be. So what I experienced as a process engineering co-op in the oil and gas industry was a lot of unit health tracking as well as project work, whereas most of what I'm experiencing at my current job, um, and specifically just because it's such a new site, is a lot of operational support. So. I guess at my old, when I was on co-op as a process engineer, I wouldn't expect to be able to run the plant, whereas today I feel pretty confident that if we had to have a not control room operator step out, I could sit down and run the board at my plant in order to keep things running. Um, so a process engineer, to most people's standards, is being able to uh, push production uh, and make the company the greatest amount of money uh, for the correct safety benefits and everything else as it's accounted for. And sometimes that just means keeping the plant running and doing what it takes to do that. So if that means picking up a shovel and going to shovel, or that means sitting down or calling everything you can remember from your heat transfer and fluids classes and doing all the calculations behind reactor design, like that's what you need to do that day. So I guess that's a little summary of what I do. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lisa. So I know we're running a little long, but um, we have a couple other great um, speakers um, to share with you too as well. So if everybody can hang on for the Q&A towards the end. Um, I just want to share the next slide here real quick. And we have a couple current students who are going to share um, a little bit about their experiences um, with their co-op rotation. So um, Kayla, if um, you want to go first, and then Lauren, if you want to follow, um, that would be great. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Kayla Chapman. I'm uh, currently a senior, and I'll be graduating this December. Uh, so the picture that Chanda just had up was me uh, at the Smuckers plant in Orville, Ohio, where actually I already accepted a full-time position there to be working as a process engineer um, with the Jams and, Je Jams and Jellies line. So I was very fortunate, 
fortunate to have four different co-ops uh, through the University of Toledo. So my first one was uh, in Holland, Ohio with a company called PTI, which is Plastic Technologies Incorporated. So there I was just a project engineer uh, role where I worked with a lot of major companies such as Pepsi and Palmolive to help design um, their plas plastic bottles uh, where we tested them there and um, optimized their performance. Uh, then I worked for Cooper Tire and Rubber in Finley, Ohio. So transitioned from plastics to rubber. So there's actually a lot of correlations with the materials there. So my first semester, I worked on the analytical lab um, with a lot of analytical equipment. So infrared spectroscopy and um, looking at very mo molecular level uh, rubber particles, which is very interesting. And then um, my second term there, I wor worked out in the manufacturing plant. So it was very different. Um, when you picture a tire, you don't think of how much engineering actually goes into it, but there are so many intricate levels and um, processes that go into making a tire. So I worked on the calendaring process, which essentially takes rubber and applies it to cord, uh, which helps with reinforcing um, part of the tire. So from there, I um, went down to New Orleans, Louisiana to work for Folgers Coffee. So from tires to coffee, the plants were significantly different. It did smell amazing down there. Uh, so I learned a lot about um, roasting coffee beans. So that was my role. I was a process engineer in the roasting department. So we worked a lot with optimizing, getting the uh, roasters to be consistent and making sure that the coffee would taste same from the same from batch to batch for all of the different types of coffee that you would see on the shelves. So I, like I said, have had vastly different experiences. I definitely enjoyed working in the food industry the most, although I did find rubbers and plastic both interesting as well. So I think that Toledo has done a phenomenal job to help assist me in getting the co-op rotations that I was able to get and all of the classwork that I've done um, and learned from the experiences have definitely helped me become the engineer um, and I cannot wait to get started once I graduate. So thank you. Thank you, Kayla. Uh, Lauren, would you mind going next? Yep, absolutely. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Lauren Bachman. I am currently um, I guess in between my junior and senior year of the chemical engineering program. I'll be graduating uh, next year in 2022. Um, I am currently on co-op right now, actually. This is my third co-op with the Lubrizol Corporation. So Lubrizol, you won't find any finished products or like big name ticket items under their company name. Um, Lubrizol makes additives that go into a bunch of different things. Um, so each plant around the country kind of does different things. So I'm not going to go into detail as specifically what they all do. Too much to list. But um, on my first term, I worked in Avon Lake, Ohio. Um, I was working as a pilot plant process engineer. So the pilot plant is smaller scale batches before they run into full scale manufacturing. Um, so I worked with uh, devising a system so that engineers could request their stuff to be run through the trial batches in the pilot plant. Um, I also worked with updating the procedures and the standardization with how they clean the vessels in between their trial batches. Um, so that was fun on my first term. My second term, I moved to Spartanburg, South Carolina, also with Lubrizol, and I worked in a um, production slash manufacturing role where I was the assistant in some new trial batches that were going to uh, manufacturing scale. So, you know, they've gone past the smaller ones and now they're at full scale. Um, so I did a lot of troubleshooting, process engineering, uh, manufacturing stuff with that. And then currently I'm working in the Bowling Green facility as a project engineer. So if we have any capital projects to be done, whether that's installing new equipment and instrumentation or updating current and existing information. Um, 
I am responsible for kind of going through the engineering uh, document trail, so to say, to uh, make that happen. So that includes internal engineering reviews, you know, going over the designs for new systems or updated systems, and then eventually writing the documents to request the capital funds from corporate to go through with those. Um, I work with a lot of vendors and contractors to get quotes on different pieces of equipment and labor. Um, all that information needs to go into the documentation um, that we send off to corporate. So that's kind of what I'm doing right now. And then next summer, I will be on my fourth co-op term with Lubrizol. Um, I'll be in Brexville, Ohio, working in their business division, actually. So I'll be the bridge in between um, business and engineering, which will be interesting to see. Um, so yeah, I've really enjoyed all of my co-op experiences. Something great about the company that I work for is that since they do so many different things, each site is truly vastly different from another. So you, I can move around within the same company and experience so many different industries. Um, I could work in transportation with like fuel additives or driveline fluids. Um, I could work in polymers with like moisture wicking fabric and athletic material um, or, yeah, or factants or soaps, shampoos and stuff like that. So chemical engineering is really, really a broad industry. Um, and I just, I guess the advice with that that I would pass on is even if you don't know what you would want to do with chemical engineering or a specific industry, there are companies out there that have their hand in kind of a bunch of different ones. So you will have more than enough opportunity to explore uh, what you might want to do down the line. I think that is absolutely excellent advice, Lauren. So thank you so much. And again, I hope everybody can stick around. Um, we are going to um, go back to the presentation because I think Gabe from Undergraduate Admissions is joining us and um, he just has a few slides to talk about and then we'll open it up for Q&A. Excellent. Thank you so much, Shonda. I really appreciate it. So I'm here to talk about the application process. So uh, first of all, if you haven't applied yet, uh, you should definitely do that ASAP. We opened up for our application for the fall of 2022 for direct from high school students on August 2nd. So we are test optional, meaning uh, you have the opportunity to apply for admission with your transcript, of course, but you have the decision to make if you want to include an ACT, an SAT score, or maybe even both of them. And the reason we do that is we want each student to be able to put their best foot forward academically and so when you do, again, either way, with the test or without, you receive a holistic review for as soon as possible admission. Also, you will receive a merit scholarship if you apply with a minimum of a 3.44 grade point average. And uh, now here's the difference between the admission process and the merit scholarship process. So we are test optional for admission but test blind for merit scholarships. Meaning, even if you decide to include an ACT or SAT, we will not look at that for merit scholarship consideration. It's GPA only. Again, which is different than test optional, meaning if you include it, we'll look at it. If you don't, we won't. So just keep that in mind. However, if you do decide to include a test for admission purposes, we will also super score. So multiple ACTs, multiple SATs, we will cherry pick the best sub scores, come up together for a combined, uh, put those all together for a combined best composite from either one of those tests. And we'll use that for admission purposes. So you definitely wanna make sure that you apply early for priority financial aid consideration. Uh, that includes all the scholarships, uh, financial aid with the FAFSA for loans, for uh, possible work study jobs on campus and also grants. So let's talk a little bit about those scholarships. So I mentioned the Merit Scholarship Program. Starting at a 3.4 GPA, as long as you apply no later than January 3rd of your senior year, you'll be automatically considered for those. And so the Merit Scholarship is based on GPA only, as I mentioned, is test blind. And there are three levels of scholarships. There's a $3,500 level, the 5,000 level, and the 6,000 level. So starting at 3.4, the higher your GPA, the higher your level of scholarship. So those are automatic and they're also renewable for your second, third, and fourth years. Now, for those of you that are out of state, we have a Rocket Nation scholarship. Now that one happens to begin at a 
or a better grade point average. So if you earn the Rocket Nation, you'll go, you'll have $8,000 renewable towards that close to $9,500 out of state fee. So it goes towards covering most of that. So for instance, let's just say you receive the $5,000 scholarship where you then, and you're from out of state. Well, I should say other than Monroe County in Michigan, but if you're out of state, you're gonna add that 5,000 Rocket Nation to that 5,000 Merit Scholarship. And that uh, deadline is also January 3rd. The Presidential Scholarship is our top overall scholarship at the university, both in prestige and also dollar amount. It is a true full ride. So it's full tuition, full fees, full room, full board, and a $3,000 stipend towards maybe a research project or a study abroad. So uh, that application is separate than the admission application. And uh, you wanna make sure that you apply to that no later than December 1st. So it's very competitive. Only a handful of students are selected for that scholarship. And I literally mean a handful. So five figures on this hand, so definitely a handful. Uh, but again, very prestigious, very lucrative. Next is the Levis Leadership Scholarship. The deadline for that is February 1st. And for that scholarship, there's $1,000 uh, per year. However, the true value in that scholarship is the leadership skills that you're going to learn for your four years throughout a student at the University of Toledo. There are 40 students selected for that. So every year, 40, so 40 times four, there'll be 160 total students. So a large cohort that are working their way through the university through this leadership program. In addition to the students that you'd get to know through engineering, through possibly honors and any other thing that you're involved with on campus. Lastly, uh, the last two we got going, Student Financial Aid General Scholarship. So that's one application for many general scholarships across the university. It could be donor scholarships, special programs, and so forth. So you want to submit that application, again, no later than January 3rd, and you'll automatically, with that one application, be applying to many scholarships across the board. Last but not least, college and program-specific scholarships. So uh, the College of Engineering has scholarships that they award. So you just want to jump on our scholarship website. You'll find uh, an opportunity to create a profile of yourself, meaning your GPA, your test score, things you're involved in, your year in high school, so on and so forth, uh, your major. And then what happens when you click submit, it spits back out to you a list of uh, uh, scholarships that you'd be eligible to apply for, the deadlines, how to get this, uh, the application and so on. So the biggest thing that I really I can um, enforce with you is to apply now, apply early for the fall of 2022, meet all the deadlines, and you'll be well on your way to earning some really great scholarship money. So thanks, really appreciate you. Again, I work with the Office of Admission. If you have any questions regarding your application, the admissions process, feel free to uh, contact us at any time. You also, every single one of you has a personal admission representative based on where you live. And so you can jump on our admissions website, find out who that person is, and then have that direct contact with them throughout the rest of the school year. So thanks again, really appreciate you. Go Rockets. Thanks, Gabe. Okay, I think we're gonna open it up for questions. So I am going to stop sharing my screen here and then just ask all our panel members to um, rejoin us. Um, if you want to go ahead and unmute and ask a question, you're welcome to do that. Um, or you can put your question in the chat box if you'd like and um, we will be happy to answer questions. So, and I think Dr. Coleman is gonna to return to uh, join us as well. So, do we have any questions yet? No questions so far. Any of our this is like being in class. Yes, right. Do you have any questions, Dr. Coleman? Would you like well, to- you know I would, I would love to kick it off and, and I can throw this at anybody who wants to answer it. Um, if you were, oh, there's a question there. Oh, there is a question, yeah. What is so the difference see. between a chemical engineer and a process engineer? Whoever would like to take that one. So I guess um, in my mind, like chemical engineering is your type of degree. So chemical engineers study uh, as Dr. Coleman said, like a, a wide variety of chemical things such as mass transfer, heat transfer, um, fluids, all of that. Um, whereas a process engineer to me is more of a job title. So a process engineer can have a background in mechanical engineering, process engineering, bio en or chemical engineering, bioengineering, anything. Um, but the type of work that you do as a process engineer is focused 
on traditionally, at least at my plant, chemical related things um, such as throughput. Um, and you do need the skills from a chemical engineering degree to perform that job, um, but it can be held by anyone with uh, a different type of engineering degree. Awesome, thanks Lisa. Anybody else with a question? Feel free to put them in the chat or go ahead and unmute. While we're waiting, I will, so this is a magic I'm going to say, so it's going to have a question. I'll throw out a question to uh, anyone who'd like to address it. And, and that is, you know, if, if you can think back to just a few years ago when you were first thinking about chemical engineering about uh, what you might do, some advice that you would have liked to have had kind of going forward. You've got a little, you've got a good bit of experience down at the beginning of your career. Any advice that you can um, send to a late high school student, I guess the way say that. Prospective students, yeah. Perspective student, there you go. Yep. So I would say the biggest piece of advice I have is that when you get to college, like um, meet as many people as possible. So like meet as many upperclassmen, especially the people that are going to be graduating the semester that uh, you're entering college um, and like get involved in freshman interest groups as well, because that's a great way to meet uh, upperclassmen and then meet like the friends of those upperclassmen. Um, and I say that and it probably sounds silly, but like when you start to look for a co-op or when you start to look full time, those connections are going to be more valuable to you than um, most other things that you're going to have like in your uh, bag of tricks. I'm thinking Dan wants to say something too. Dan looks like he has some words of wisdom. I was thinking so hard. Dr. Cullen always asks the hard questions. So if any of you prospective students end up coming and have her for class, she always asks the hard questions. Uh, but I will say, and I gave this advice uh, a while ago when I was still a student, uh, learn when to say no. You're going to be asked as a student to do so many different things. You're going to be asked to volunteer for so many things. And Chanda's probably laughing. Chanda and Dr. Cullen are probably laughing at me right now because I don't think I said no to hardly anything while I was in college. Um, but learning when to say no, learning when you don't want, that's something you understand. It's like, you do not want to pursue that. That's okay to say, and that's okay to decide because then it allows you to really focus on an activity or a career that you really do want to pursue. I knew I didn't want to pursue a career in oil and gas. So I chose to say no to applying to oil and gas companies. And I focused on applying to food and beverage companies. So learning when to say no, even if it's small things like, hey, do you want to go join this organization or do this event? It'd be really fun. It's like, if you don't want to do it, it's okay to say no and just be have the courage to say no. So it looks like we've got a couple questions. Um, one is, how exactly does the selection process for mandatory co-ops work? So I can field that one. Um, so basically, students are assigned to either a co-op plan A or co-op plan B um, during their freshman year, spring semester of their freshman year. So co-op plan A, the first co-op rotation is the spring semester of their sophomore year. And co-op plan B, first co-op rotation would be in the summer semester of the sophomore year. So, and from there you rotate between coursework and co-op work experiences. Um, so co-op uh, assignments or co-op work um, as assignments are not assigned. So basically what happens is um, the college has career expos twice a year. Um, they also have other networking opportunities, but at the, at the expos, for example, employers come to the College of Engineering and you have the opportunity to network with these um, company representatives. You dress up professionally, you have your um, resume that you created in professional development class. And hopefully from there, by talking with the company representatives, you're able to secure a, um, an interview and then um, interview and potentially then get a um, offer from a company. So um, the College of Engineering supplies you with a lot of the tools that you need in order to be successful in securing um, those co-ops um, on your own then. They're not actually assigned by our um, college. So hopefully that helps answer that question. Um, looks like we've got a couple more. Um, do you recommend getting a, a degree past a bachelor's in chemical engineering? We want to field that one. Um, I would say, I mean, I'm a little bit different with the, the medical degree, but I have friends that have gotten MBAs. I would say 
if you ever consider going past a chemical engineering degree, um, make sure you're passionate about it. You know, if you're passionate about business, then it's good to get an MBA. It kind of translates also, also into like an accounting too. Like people will get an accounting degree and then think about getting a CPA or like finance get a CPA. Um, you can also use it to progress in your career as well. I know a lot of people get MBAs to um, you know, push forward and move up the corporate ladder. Um, and I think uh, there's some classes that you can take uh, in undergrad that can help you put credits towards an MBA as well. Shana, maybe yep. I'll talk about that as well. But if you're thinking about chemical engineering or, uh, sorry, medical school or law school or something, just make sure you're passionate about it because typically those degrees may take, um, you know, longer as well. And then it's very enticing to not go into that because um, chemical engineering is such a great um, field to work in. I actually heard some advice. Um, like if you want to do medical school, make sure you don't have a really good backup plan. So like people like, and I was an exception to that people, um, like myself typically will not go into medical school because chemical engineering is such a great backup plan. But if you're forced to go into medical school with a biology degree and neuroscience degree, then typically you will finish your, you know, your way through because that's the only option you have. Um, so just make sure you're passionate about it. I guess it's the best advice that I can give. And, uh, if it helps you move up the corporate ladder, then it could be something you'd think about as well. Yeah. To piggyback on what Zach said. Um, yeah, he's absolutely right. A lot of our alumni will go on later on to pursue an MBA, um, perk there being that sometimes their employer will pay for it too. But, um, our, in our program, the um, minor in chemistry is already incorporated into the curriculum. So, um, obviously that's an automatic. Um, with the degree, but um, a lot of our students will pursue the minor in general business, which those are the classes that there is an MBA track that Zach mentioned that um, fulfill prereqs for an MBA program here at Toledo. So if that's something that you are interested in doing, you know, down the road somewhere along the line, you'd have the opportunity to do that MBA then um, with that minor in um, business administration. And I would say that's probably the um, second most popular minor that um, our students um, pursue in this program then. We got another one. Um, would chemical engineering be the right degree to pursue if I want to get into the cosmetics industry compared to pharmaceutical science degrees? Can I oh, jump in for a minute on that? And then I'll, I'll let somebody else talk. Um, uh, just to, as a comment that I hear is that there is a lot of overlap in uh, chemical engineering and cosmetics. And in fact, here at uh, Toledo, we just started a couple of years ago um, and Chenna can provide more information uh, offline about it, but we started a minor in uh, cosmetics engineering with the pharmaceutical program, and they have the cosmetic science side. And so there's uh, uh, there are opportunities within uh, the discipline, both in terms of employment, but also in terms of uh, curriculum to learn more about cosmetics. I think somebody else was going to respond. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, where's Dr. Libertori or Alyssa Adams on this call? Uh, they would be great resources. But I think it goes back to what Zach was talking about earlier. It's really what do you want to pursue? Um, if you're passionate about it and you're passionate about uh, cosmetics, uh, chemical engineering will launch you, pharmaceutical science will launch you, but what area of cosmetics do you want to be? And you may not know the answer to that yet. Uh, just like many of us probably didn't know the answer of Oh, we got these chemical engineering degree. We know we wanted to go into, say, for me, the food and beverage industry, but I still don't know exactly what do I want to be in the food industry. So it'll, that'll part will take time. But uh, if you're, I think the chemical engineering degree will definitely set you up for success. And then I'm sure either Chanda or Dr. Coleman can forward uh, Dr. Libertori or maybe contact uh, Alyssa Adams. I know Delissa, I think, was pursuing that cosmetics science, cosmetics engineering potentially minor. It's been a while since I've talked to her, but. I just know her from AICHE and I'm sure she would be a great resource. Yep. Um, so, go ahead. So I was going to say, I actually did research with the professor that Dan's referencing, um, Dr. Liberatore, when I was in college. Um, and actually a large chunk of the research I did was in combination with the uh, pharmaceutical science, cosmetic science uh, majors. Um, so they did a lot of formulation as far as liquid lipsticks, sunscreens. Um, I did foundations, a lot of that. Um, and then I did mechanical testing through Dr. Liberatore's lab on a lot of that. Um, and this was far prior to the uh, uh, dual degree minor that uh, Chan and Dr. Coleman are talking about. 
Um, but one of the nice things about Toledo, especially in the chemical engineering department, is that if you go in and you know you want to do cosmetics, there are professors that do researches in that area. Or if you go in and you know you want to do plastics, there's options to research with professors in those areas. Um, and they're really easy to find, and they're definitely open to just about all of the students. Um, so if you go into the Toledo Chemical Engineering Program, knowing that's what you want to do, those doors will be open to you. I think that was our last question. So anybody have any other questions before we conclude? Because I know we're a little bit over, but this was some really good stuff, so. Okay, so um, I think we're gonna go ahead and wrap things up then. So again, I wanna say thank you to um, our current students and our alumni for joining us on this panel. Um, you, your information that you shared with us has been invaluable, and I hope that our guest students um, have really enjoyed the presentation. Um, there are a couple links there in the chat. Looks like Gabe put a couple in there um, about, you know, admission and then also scholarships. So if you have any questions, um, you're welcome to um, reach out to Gabe at Undergrad Admission. Um, of course, if you have any questions about chemical engineering or our program as well, um, you're welcome to reach out to me or Dr. Coleman. Um, we're always happy to answer any questions that you might have about our program and share. Um, I'm so happy that we have alum and our current students who are willing to share their experiences with you. So um, thank you again for everybody for joining us and sorry for running over a little bit. But like I said, I think it was um, very um, important that we, we touched on all these topics. And like I said, all the information that you had um, was just invaluable. Dr. Coleman, do you have anything that you wanted to add? I just want to again thank the panelists for joining us today and for um, the um, others that are with us today. Thank you for taking time. And uh, I learned a lot. I always love these panels because I actually learn what everybody's doing. Yep, um, I agree. Just keeps broadening my horizons on what these can do. So thank you, everybody. All right. Thank you.